In this day and age, it can often be hard to tell who is even a Christian. Well, today on Daily Renewal, we're going to discuss what it means to walk in truth and how important that is. And then from there, I'm going to show you how to walk in truth. In this day and age, it's often hard to differentiate between those who call themselves believers or Christians and those who aren't. You know, there's a lot of different things that have crept into the church world that are either non-biblical uh, or extra-biblical, uh, if you will. And uh, there's also a real emphasis on different type of types of spiritualism. There's a lot of mixture that's come in. And so this idea of walking in the truth is a big deal, and it was a big deal in the early church. So today, we're going to talk about what it means to walk in the truth. We're going to talk about the importance of walking in the truth. And then from there, we're going, I'm going to give you some practical things that will show you how you can develop a lifestyle of walking in the truth. I'm Pastor Lyle, and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, I just want to encourage you to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel. And also, if you're getting benefit from our content, please like and share this video with anybody that you think it will be helpful to. Well, we're going to take a look at the book of 3 John today, and it starts off with what many people look at as just being a basic greeting. And it's often treated that way. But I, I want to challenge you today to look beyond, uh, you know, often there's times in the scripture where there's some things that you might look at as just being uh, just basic things. But if you study them a little deeper, you'll find out that there's often a lot more meaning in some of these things than what we give them credit for or what we give God credit for. And in this particular portion, I believe this is one of those instances. In 3 John, we see that John is writing a letter to his uh, beloved friend uh, Gaius. And Gaius uh, you know, is involved with the church, and the church is, is, has got some people in it that are doing good things, some people that are causing problems. And Gaius is, is obviously in some kind of a position where you know, maybe he's a leader, leader in this church. But John is writing to him. Uh, to encourage him, uh, encourage him to con continue on. And uh, so we pick up at the very beginning of this letter, there's some important things that he says to him as he greets him. And so we see this in 3 John, starting at the very beginning. He says, The elder to the beloved uh, Gaius, or Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So we see here that John is, is relaying to, uh, to Gaius here that he's so excited to hear, you know, that, that, that you've got this walk that is really making a difference. And we see this in particular, these, there's three things that are kind of pointed out here. And the first one is he says, first of all, I've heard from people that I trust. You know, I've heard from brethren. They've come back and they've told me about your walk of truth. And then he says, uh, not only that, he talks about the fact that he's walking in truth. So there's evidence that there is a walk that he has that lines up with the truth. Now, if you watch Daily Renewal any length of time, you'll know that uh, you know we talk about the Word of God being the truth. You can't separate God from his Word. So in other words, when he's saying that he's walking in the truth, he's saying there's evidence that he's walking out uh, what we come to know as the Bible today, or walking out the Scriptures, walking out the words that God has given him. So he says, we're hearing this from credible people that we trust. We're also seeing that it lines up with the truth. And then the third one, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so the third thing we see here is walking in truth to those who are also walking in truth. It's a joy when you see that other people's lives are bearing fruit as a result of them walking in the truth. So walking in truth is, is a pretty big deal. Now, but that brings me to the question, well, you know, what is walking in truth? You know, what does that mean? You know, I, I've heard some, uh, some people try to describe that, but one of the best definitions that I've heard of walking in truth 
uh, was actually brought to us um, by Charles Spurgeon. And uh, I'll just paraphrase one of the things that he said. Uh, to walk in truth is to walk consistently uh, with the truth that you believe. Now, if we were to just stop there, then we would have a problem because, you know, everybody is basically, they, they, everybody has a belief system, whether you're a believer, a Christian or not. And, you know, we try to live by that belief system. And the problem is, if that belief system is not based on the truth, or in this case, the word of God, then we are, um, we, we often, we just change our, uh, change uh, to adjust to whatever we think. Now, when we have the Bible as the truth, when we believe that, that, that the Bible is the unwavering, uh, inerrant, um, infallible Word of God, and we base our life on the truth, then we have something that is in, uh, unchangeable to guide our path. But when we just uh, have a belief system that's made up of our own thinking, well, then we can change that whenever we want to to make it uh, uh, to adjust it so that uh, you know so that it doesn't really have any power behind it. You know, uh, we can't trust in our own intellect. So this idea of of walking in the truth, we see here as is talked about as walking consistently with the truth you believe, but it goes on to say this, or Spurgeon goes on to say this, to walk in truth means to walk in a way that is real and genuine without any phoniness or concealment. Now, again, what we have to understand about walking in truth from a, a Christian perspective is walking with a conviction that the Bible is how we want to live our lives. And this is really interesting because, you know, as I look at a lot of things that are going on today, you ask most Christians and they'll say, oh, well, I live by the Bible. But often we don't spend enough time in the Bible, or most people don't, to actually know what some of the, the principles and some of the thoughts, some of the ways that God says are his ways actually are. And so, you know, for us to, to truly, truly walk in truth as a, as a Christian, we have to have the kind of life that not only um, uh, knows what the Bible says, but actively wants to adjust our lives as God reveals himself in his word. And we're going to get a little bit more into that uh, as we go, uh, go today. So as we look at this, we can see that John is making it very clear that this idea of walking in truth is a big deal. And uh, so the, the encouragement that he brings here to Gaius and saying, hey, I'm hearing from other people that you're walking in truth. I can see that the, 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 the scriptures are actually evident in your life. God is working because your life is an example of what the scriptures say a Christian should look like. And then from there, he, he's, he's uh, encouraging them by saying, hey, and obviously, you know, there's, uh, it's encouraging me and there's a reputation that Gaius is, is uh, getting because he's somebody that people can see that, that, uh, that there's a change in his life. And make no mistake about it, friend, that when you make a decision to follow Jesus, there is going to be some dramatic changes for the better in your life. You know, once you start uh, walking with him, we, we begin to see, as I've talked about many times on uh, Daily Renewal, uh, in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit developed, where you'll see more uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You'll see that these things will naturally begin to flourish in your life, unlike uh, the, the days when you weren't depending on God. You know, we can all have a measure of those things, but it isn't until we truly walk with the Lord that those things can flourish at their utmost. And, uh, and, you know, that only comes through relationship with Jesus. So we see that it's very important that we take this idea of walking in truth seriously. You know, we can't just have the kind of lifestyle or the kind of mindset, I guess I could say, that, uh, you know what, well, I just got saved, I know Jesus, and now I can live any way I want. You know, understand that you play a major role. How you walk, how you allow the Holy Spirit to develop you as a believer, as a person, is really important. So that brings me to the next question. Well, you know, so how do you develop? What, how do this walking in truth, how do you do it? You know, what's the process? And, 
you know, it, it's very important to understand that it's not like I like you can just say, okay, well, you know, if you just you, you just do this, if you do this three step plan, if you make sure you pray every day and read your Bible every day and go to church, and you know, you know, those things can play a role in those things in, in that development. But we have to understand that anything to do with God, it doesn't, it never has to do with a uh, a works issue or a an issue where you know it's a to do list. It has everything to do with the heart. And, you know, God's desire for us, once he begins, once you make that decision for Christ and you realize just how much he cares for you, how much he loves you, one of the first things that begins to happen is you want to reciprocate that. You want to give that back to him. It's always a heart issue when it comes to God, even in how we serve him. He's not looking for robots. He's looking for people who desire to diligently seek him. And in Hebrews, it talks about the fact that we have to understand and we have to believe that he is, is God, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the idea of pursuing God is something that we will be doing for the rest of our time here on earth. And uh, the, the more that we pursue, the more God will, again, reciprocate and, and build that relationship. But it starts with us, you know, well, it started with him, but then from us just wanting to develop that relationship with Jesus. So let's look at this. The idea of walking in truth, yes, it's important, but if, if, we're, if we carefully examine this greeting, we realize that, that John is actually showing us something here, a key to us being able to walk in truth. Now, some versions uh, don't pick this up as clearly, but most modern translations translate this very closely to what I've read to you today in the New King James Version. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be the New King James Version, but many versions translate verse 2 similarly to this. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. The key to walking, or one of the major keys to walking in truth is the prosperity of your soul. Now, I've done some videos on the, on the, the soul and the restoration of the soul. The restoration, the restoration of the soul is a real important part of our walk. I encourage you to take a look and, like I mentioned, I've done some videos on this in the past and I'll probably do more on it because there's not a lot of focus on this in a lot of Christian circles. But we have to understand that our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our mind being the, the, our thinking, uh, our will means our desire to do things, and our emotions, which is our feelings like love, joy, uh, hatred, and grief. These are all things that when we start off our walk with God or before we come to God, these are all things that are often guided by our ourselves, guided by our flesh as often mentioned, uh, guided by our own fleshly lusts. This is something that we have to understand. This is a key component to what God wants to bring transformation to in our lives. And so, you know, with us, and I'm going to I'll get into more of this in just a few, few moments, but we have to understand that when we become a Christian, God begins to make adjustments to our soul. Again, he makes adjustments as we uh, give ourselves to him, to our mind, our will, and our emotions. In other words, our thinking begins to change. In other words, my, my thinking isn't like it. I start thinking differently. I start thinking kingdom-minded. I start thinking about what God would have me do because a lot of my thinking, uh, pretty near all my thinking up to that point, uh, uh, the point of, of me making a decision for Christ was all about me. Uh, even in times where maybe I was doing good for other people, usually there was some kind of a benefit for me. It made me feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, God wants to change our thinking to be like His. So, in the in the uh, in the idea of our soul uh, prospering, we see that there will be a change in our thinking. There'll be a change in our will. Uh, again, our desire. What desires we have? Our, most of our desires are wrapped around us up until that point where you know where we meet Jesus and then he changes our desires to be for for the things of God and then of course our emotions the things that we love the things we hate those things will begin to change again as you begin to cultivate a walk with Jesus this isn't something we necessarily try to do 
These are things that through relationship will just begin to be transformed uh, because, uh, because that relationship's being built. And you can see that even in natural relationships. A lot of the times, the way that you, you think, the way that you act, the person you're with, they have an effect on those things. Well, more so when we consider a relationship with God, it's God's desire for us to prosper in our mind, in our will, and in our emotions. And as our mind, will, and emotions, our soul, begin to line up with God and His way of doing things, as they begin to be, begin to be transformed, that's when prosperity of the soul really begins to happen. Now, it's important that we understand that he's showing us a link here between walking in truth and the prosperity of the soul. You cannot walk in truth unless your soul becomes open, uh, unless that soul begins to change, unless that thinking begins to change, that will begins to change, those emotions begin to change. When those things begin to change, then it changes the outside, the, uh, the things that you do, the way that you walk, the way people see things. You know, often we look at Christianity and uh, we tell people, you need to do this, you make sure you don't do this, you don't wear this, you, you don't smoke this. Uh, you know, and often it can be a form of behavior modification without the transformation of the soul. So the important part we have to understand in this idea of uh, walking in truth is there has to be a transformation or a, 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 um, a restoration a back to what God wants uh, originally wanted the soul to be. Uh, a restoration of the soul. When that begins to happen, then the way you walk begins to change. Now, I want you to notice this. He says here, in, in, again, in, um, in verse 2, he says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, again, as your soul prospers. Now, the problem that we often run into in Christianity, again, we have to have the right focus. What he is saying here is he's saying that we need to have a focus on the prosperity of the soul. Now, the amazing part about this is, is often in Christian circles, and I've gotten caught up in this just as much as uh, anybody else, you know, often when we hear preaching or teaching that has more focus on prosperity in the things that we do here on earth or even our health, uh, th these things, there's nothing wrong. Do I believe, for instance, do I think that we should be healthy? Absolutely, I believe we should be healthy. Uh, you know, myself, I've had to go, go through some major things in my life that have changed the way that I, that I live in order to be more healthy. But, uh, you know, we can see often throughout the New Testament, there was a lot of people that followed Jesus just for what Jesus did, whether it was for the miracles or whether it was just for, the, you know, the, the time when he fed them with loaves and fishes. You know, he, he, he basically came against them and said, you know, you guys are just coming to me for what, what you can get from me. And see, we have to be very careful that we don't uh, get a form of religion or even Christianity, that we look at Christianity as what I can get from God. He's not our heavenly Santa Claus. Uh, so that's one aspect that's covered there, the idea of healing. God is our healer, but I've seen many people that get so focused on wanting healing that they forget that they need to be drawn close to the healer. If you are close to the healer, then uh, then you're going to have an eternal reward. There's lots of people in this world that will never uh, have a fully functioning body. That will never truly necessarily be healed this side of heaven. But uh, it would be a real shame if, if you had, and we know lots of people, if you use prosperity or the what world looks like at pros as prosperity, there's a lot of people that are prosperous according to the world that look completely healthy and yet are not prosperous in the soul. That is a problem. We have to have the focus mainly on the prosperity of the soul. The other things are important, but not as important. And when we look even at the term of, of prosperity, you know, there's a, a lot of Christian circles that, you know, would even preach a message that if you're not prosperous, then you're not walking in faith. You know, you're not seeing God's best. If Like, if you're not healed and prosperous, then that's an indication you're not doing well. You don't have enough faith, brother. No, the big thing that we take out of this is, is that, you know, Paul or, uh, John was praying 
for, for Gaius, that, you know what, I, I pray that everything that you put your hand to, I pray that, you know, you prosper in everything you do, and I do prosper here in health. But the focus has to be the prosperity of the soul, because it's the prosperity of the soul that will allow you to walk in truth. Having lots of money, having no physical problems, that doesn't mean that you are walking properly before the Lord. So, having said that, let's get to this idea of how, how, to, how, to, how to really prosper. What's God's idea of prosperity? Well, when you look at the idea of prosperity, especially in this context, um, a lot of people in that greeting, it was a common greeting that was used in this day and age, and when they talk about uh, the idea of, of prospering, what it really meant is uh, praying that you have a good journey, praying that your life is a good journey, that you succeed or that things go well with you. And, you know, I can honestly say there was times in my life where I had more money, where I had you know more things that a lot of people might consider more prosperous. But as I continue on my walk with God, I find now with less money and less less trappings, there's more of a prosperity in my life. And I can speak for many people that have told me the same, that true prosperity comes in walking out this journey and having a good journey. You know, as I walk out my life, I've got many stories of the things that God has used me for, you know, the things that, uh, you, know, you know, some of the stories of God, things that God has done ar around and uh, my life and with people around me. And you know what? I can honestly say that prosperity has gone beyond the things that I can get in this world and has transferred into some of the things that, that uh, you know, I'm, as I'm living here today, I'm living with all the all my needs met, but also the preparation for eternity being uh, in in in, uh, in the forefront. In other words, the idea of what we're talking about here with the prosperity of the soul. True prosperity has to do with our journey. Uh, yes, this side of heaven, but we don't know exactly all the things that are beyond here. So it's important that we concentrate on allowing the Lord to uh, prosper our soul. So. And the idea of true prosperity, I want to flip over to the book of Joshua, and uh, because uh, it's talked about the idea of, of how to prosper. And uh, in, in Joshua 1, uh, starting in verse 8, he says this. He says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So we see a key here. It talks about the book of the law. Well, the book of the law in the Old Testament was the scriptures. You know, We know it as the Old Testament. But the, the principle here is that there needs to be a meditation on the things of God. And it, notice here, it says this. It says, you will meditate in them day and night that you may observe to do all, uh, do according to all that's written in it. So, so is this saying that we need to spend all of our time reading the Bible? No. But what this is saying is, is there needs to be a lifestyle that is God-centered. And when I say God-centered, that has to include the scriptures. God has given us what we know as the Bible. I've done some messages on this, on how the Bible came together, and we can trust the scriptures as we have them today. So having a lifestyle that is, that is centered around the Bible, but not only that, it has to be centered, and it says that uh, when we meditate in it day and night, it says that we may observe to do according to all, all is written in it. So again, this comes down to having a lifestyle that is centered on God so that it will change how we do things. Again, Christianity is not a book of rules. It's not a, here's, you need to do this to be, to put a smile on God's face. You need to do that, or if you do this, it, it'll make him mad. You know, there's things that can anger God. There's things that please God. But, but see, for us, we have to get out of this works mentality. The mentality is this. I want to get close to the Lord. One of the ways that he uh, shows us to get close to him is to meditate. In other words, have a lifestyle of walking with him. And if you desire to have a lifestyle of walking with him, then what happens is 
Uh, you'll have a desire to walk in his ways and you will be given the grace or the power of God that will, will enable you to be able to walk in his ways. It's not about us just trying hard. No, it has everything to do with relationship and him empowering you. So when we look at this idea, this is where it starts. There has to be a desire to have a God-centered, and I will say Bible-centered, uh, you know, because this is God's word. He shows us how to live. If we've got a God-centered lifestyle and we want to to uh, live like he wants us to live, then, then that's the first key is we have to desire that. Now, when you make the decision that you want, uh, you, know, you, you want to walk, uh, walk with the Lord, you know, that you want to walk in truth, then this is where it gets exciting. We're going to turn over to the book of Romans. And I'm going to end with this today. Uh, in the book of Romans, we see this, this desire come out. And it, it says this, in Romans 12, this is Apostle Paul talking to the church in Rome. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, for those of you who have, who have tasted and seen how good God is, it's, it's your reasonable thing. It's the thing you'll want to do. You'll want to give yourself to him, which is what we were just talking about earlier. You've got to present yourself. And then, in, in, other, in other words, you've got a desire uh, to see him. It says this in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you want to know what the will of God is for your life, then it's simply this. You present yourself to him. And again, we just showed how to do that. And allow your mind to renew, to be renewed. And again, this is what we just covered earlier with the idea of the restoration of the soul. The, the soul being the mind, the will, and the emotions. We see here that when we offer ourselves up to him, up to his word, when we have a Bible-centered or a God-centered lifestyle, then, we, then what you'll see is is uh, there's an opportunity, number one, for our mind to be renewed. But in order for that, that mind to be renewed, we have to first see what it says before that. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Now, this is the part that we have to grab a hold of. Understand this, that when we come to God, we are conformed to this world. The challenges will come and they begin, I believe that you know, they might be, be, even begin before, but when you make that decision for Christ, you are going to have crossroads in your life, decisions that you're going to really see within yourself just how much you believe. You know, do you really believe in this commitment that you've made? And you know, there'll be times where you might feel like, oh, I failed, you know, God wanted me to go this way and I, I fell backward. Friend, you just get back up. You repent and you continue to walk before the Lord. And you know what? You'll face many crossroads in your life. But understand this. The idea of, of the renewing of your mind happening, it starts with you making a decision that I do not want to be conformed to this world anymore. You've got to get to the point where you go, you know what? Anything that God shows me in my life that is, that is contrary to being conformed to him and his thinking, I want to get rid of it. And again, you're going to have times where you're going to fall on this one. But, you know, it, you, you, you just need to get back up and continue on, repent, and keep on walking. And you know what? You're going to find that a lot of these things that maybe uh, th these trappings that you have in your life, you know, as you continue to get up and walk with God, you're going to, you're going to get victory of a lot of these things. Or, you know, and there will you know, be other things that come that are a little tougher. And, you know, we can get into some of those deep, deeper episodes of some of those things. There's Sometimes there's generational things. There's a lot of other issues as well. But for today, understand this. The desire to conform to him and his will has to uh, supersede or, or become more than conforming or conforming to our own ways of thinking or the world's way of thinking. So we see here, it says uh, we have to desire it. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? And that's where this next part comes in, by the renewing of our mind, which all comes down to, uh, again, us offering ourselves and desiring, God, I want to live 
a godly lifestyle. I want to live a holy lifestyle. I want to live a life according to your word. I want to be a, a man who uh, walks in truth. And with this today, as you desire to walk in truth, God will see that desire and you will be amazed as you uh, submit yourself to God and again, desire to walk in truth. You'll be amazed at the, at the changes that happen within yourself, within your soul, within your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're going to begin to see transformation happen and uh, before long, uh, you know, you're gonna you're you're gonna look back and say, "Wow, look at the great work that God has done in my life." You know, I've been doing this for quite a few years now. I can honestly say that there's still transformation that God's doing in my life. That doesn't change. There's still more work that God wants to do. But as you continue to submit yourself to Him and allow God to work in your life, you're going to be absolutely amazed and full of joy. And other people will uh, be full of joy as well as they begin to see the changes that are happening in your life uh, uh, in regards to what God is doing as you submit yourself to him. Well, I hope you got something out of this today. If you did, uh, I just want to encourage you to consider consider, uh, being a subscriber to our channel. Uh, Also, uh, hit that like button and uh, share this video with anybody that you think that will help if uh, you think they'll get benefit from the content. And also, if you desire to help our ministry uh, financially, please... uh, Take a look at the links below. Well, I had a great set, a great time uh, bringing daily renewal uh, to you today. But until next time, God bless you and have a great day.